Hello and welcome to the Deep Sea Podcast, a punk take on a science podcast. I'm Dr. Thomas Lindley. With me as ever is Dr. Alan Jameson. You doing all right, mate? No, I'm fine. Yeah, good. Right, so to kick off, uh, what's going on in the news? What's happened in the last month in Deep Sea things? We've got a brand new Deep Sea fish. Always good to have a new fish. The giant slickhead. So the slickheads get their name because they don't have any scales on their head. So it makes their head seem smooth and, and shiny. It's not actually because of how slimy they are, although they are also slimy. They're from the Aleppo Cephalidae family, and they're actually a member of the same order as salmon and trout. So they've actually got the little adipose fin. This particular new species looks really quite salmon-y, quite trouty. It's, it's strange for a deep-sea fish. It was collected from just over 2,000 meters in Suruga Bay in Japan, and it's an absolute beast, really. That's what's noticeable about it. What did they call film. it, Tom? What did they call it? I'm going to get to that. I'm going to get to that because it's good. It's a good name. It's, it, this is a good one for our um, an ass fish by any other name would smell a sweet fish name segment. But uh, but basically, these things usually max out at about 75 centimetres. And this absolute beast was 140 centimetres, 25 kilograms, really, really big, robust fish. The other ones also mainly feed on jellies. They're quite low energy fish. They sort of hang around. But this was actually a piscivore. It eats other fish. It's a very active top level predator. It seems to be at a higher trophic level, a higher predatory level than a lot of things we see in the deep sea. They're also scavengers as well. What do they well. call it? So they what do they, what do they call it? <laughs> okay, okay, to get to it, to get to it. So the Japanese name they gave it, the, the slickheads in the in the Japanese common name for them are essentially named after sumo wrestlers. It translates roughly to massive sardine is the name for the slickheads. And since this is the biggest of the slickheads, this is the biggest of the sumo wrestlers. They named it. Yokozuna Iwashi, after the highest level of sumo wrestler. So even amongst these massive sardines, these sumo wrestler fish, it is the highest level. Can I have a t-shirt with massive sardine written on it? But then it's a picture of a sumo wrestler. Yeah, that's quite sure. cryptic, isn't it? Massive sardine, sumo. <laughs> oh, uh, not particularly deep sea, but another random little thing that's going on in the internet is people are really into sea shanties. I don't know where that's come from, but like TikTok is now all sea shanties. Do you like a sea shanty, Tom? Are you into into the wee shanty? Is that something that happens in the in the Lindley household of an evening? A wee shanty over the fire? No, no? I mean, granddad was in the navy, but we're not a we're not a seafaring people. We're from the Midlands. Oh well, it took a war to get us to sea. All right. <laughs> How about you? I've never shanted. But your your family motto is "Look to the sea," isn't it? Something like that, isn't it? Something to do with the shore. It's like get get off the sea and get back on the shore again, or something yeah. like that. To hell with the sea! But it didn't involve shantying. But you've got more of a nautical theme than... Oh, there's, yeah, there's, there's anchors on the crest. On the Jameson crest, there, there are anchors, yeah, which suggests oh. all sorts of nautical and interesting shanty-like activity. The other bit of research that came out was a study on vampire squid, showing that they buck the trend, really, of the cephalopods. Usually, the cephalopods sort of short, rapid lifespan. Amazing conversion efficiency, actually. Like 80% of the things they eat, they convert into new tissue. So they just grow incredibly quickly. And then it's this, like, boom and bust... They reproduce and then they die, which is quite heartbreaking actually, because they make they make quite interesting pets because they're so intelligent. I had a cuttlefish we called Bob until she laid eggs, and she was all proud of these eggs and tending to them. I was like, oh, Bob, you, you're going to die now. <laughs> so that was depressing. Vampire squid. They buck the trend. Basically, they they live long lives. They grow slowly and they reproduce multiple times in sort of batch spawning, and then they have a resting period in between. So that made me realise that this is the month of Valentine's Day. And so we could do a little bit of a aside on love in the deep sea. Are you honestly trying to convince me that you saw a vampire squid and a description of its reproductive cycle and it made you think of Valentine's Day? It's all about the podcast, mate. I'm just worried about what you get up to on Valentine's Day if it's the vampire squid that <laughs> reminds you of it. <laughs> well, I'd like to survive the event <laughs> to, to hopefully have many more. So in the deep sea, most animals are slow growing and long lived. In the fish, we're talking sort of decades to some being over hundreds of years old. The deep sea sharks can be twice as old as their shallow counterparts by the time they're matured. And the Greenland shark is quite famous for that recently. It doesn't mature until it's almost 200 years old. And it lives to be over 250 years as far as we're aware. So incredibly slow growing, long lived creatures. And it's generally thought to be due to limited food. And one of our favorite fish, the rat tails, the, uh, the grenadiers, on the continental slope, so a little bit shallower, they reproduce many times and dedicate roughly half of their energy to reproduction. But the abyssal species, our favourite ones, our Coryphonoides armatus and Yakine, 
They live very long lives, 40, 50 years, but they reproduce only once. And we're pretty sure they sort of die after that. And that's risky. That's quite a risky strategy that requires stability. So the reason that works for them is they live in a very stable environment that allows them to grow slowly and build up these energy reserves. They essentially spend 40 years laying down enough energy in their liver just to reproduce once. And that makes them incredibly difficult to study because we've only really found, I think it's one gravid female, one female with eggs. And so energetically, we're sort of fairly sure this is how they reproduce, but we don't know if they gather somewhere. We don't know if they migrate. We know very little about these fish that we see a lot and how they reproduce just because they do it once and we, we tend to miss it. Although there was that potential spawning event in, was it the round nose grenadier? Yeah, in Rockall. Yes, yes. They're all slowly swimming, all facing towards one direction. Uh, I'll see if I can dig out that paper. That was interesting. That was... Um... Francis. Francis Neat did that, yeah. No, we were there on the ship, we were flying the camera, and you, suddenly you saw like more grenadiers in the matter of minutes than you would normally see in the whole transect, and then suddenly they realised they were all facing in the same direction, and then there was more and more and more, and then, yeah, there was clearly a little bit of spawning going on. They weren't all facing in the same direction, they were all facing in towards some sort of point. Yeah, it felt like there was some sort of singularity or something they were all looking at, it was bizarre. So that's very cool. They're a shelf species though, aren't they? But still, we, we know so little about how these guys reproduce. That's that's interesting. So I'll see if I can tag that paper on. And then as sort of a, an adaptive extreme, there's the, the deep sea anglerfish as well, where the, the females are 10 times the length of the males. And the males totally lack the elysium. They lack that lure to attract prey. And actually, all of their sensory gear is towards finding the female. So they actually have really well-developed eyes for a deep sea fish. So they're looking for her lure. They're looking for her bioluminescence and huge nostrils. Of course, it's something difficult for us to, to film and to measure, but scent is probably very important in the deep sea when it comes to finding a mate. So they have these huge nostrils to try and find the female. And there's a, even though they're famous for being parasitic, there's sort of a spectrum. There are ones that fuse to the female completely and you know links into her blood supply and then essentially becomes a, a tumor on the female. And there are ones that sort of bond to the female just for a reproductive season and then they break away and the males are sort of free swimming to move on again. But that's a really extreme evolution to a reproductive strategy. Talking about finding a mate, there's the, the cusk eels as well. A lot of them seem to sing, essentially. Singing is probably quite flattering. It's probably more of a drumming, creaking sound, but it's, they're fish, you know, they're trying, they're trying, they sing. So they've got drumming muscles across their swim bladder or sometimes a rocker bone, which can make a creaking noise. And they use their swim bladder like the skin of a drum as like an amplifier to try and basically sing to attract a mate. So they both of the sexes sing, but the males seem to have better developed muscles. So they, they sing louder, basically. And then I guess the females can can reply. Another extreme adaptation is the deep sea lizard fish, the, the Bathysaurus. So they're unusual in being simultaneous hermaphrodites. So they're both sexes at the same time, which is really rare within invertebrates. The first to develop it, as far as we can tell, and they were the largest vertebrate clade that has simultaneous hermaphrodism. And there's not any evidence yet of self-fertilization. So it's not a self-reproduction kind of thing. It's, it's more about hedging their bets, basically. They're sit-and-wait predators. They don't run into many of their own kind. Uh, and so it's disappointing if you, you haven't met one of your own kind in years and years and years, and then you both turn out to be the same sex. So any two individuals meet, and they can reproduce. The other way of thinking of it, which I think was from Monty's book, actually, was that they maximize the size of the breeding population without increasing the size of the feeding population. So they don't put more strain on their food supply, but they're maximizing their breeding in that situation. And there's loads of other examples, but I just thought that was an interesting little taster for Valentine's Day, some of the more unusual ones. I still want to know why a vampire squid's reproduction activity reminded you of Valentine's Day. I think there's a bigger story behind that statement. Do you think we need to flip the camera and, and really it's me that we need to be picking apart yeah. my reproductive strategy? Definitely. It was at least reproduction, which I, you know. It's supposed to be the festival of love, not reproduction. I think there's a subtext. <laughs> <laughs> On this month's episode, uh, we're going to talk technology, which is, to be honest, it's, it's key to particularly deep sea science. But if you're doing anything sort of cutting edge, it, it's going to be key to that anyway. If you're doing something no one's done before, the tools don't exist. You have to often make them for yourself. And I think Monty mentioned in his interview on episode one, particularly in deep sea, you have to be, yeah, you have to be an engineer as well, because you have to build the equipment that will allow you to do the things you want to do. And I think a lot of 
certainly for your career, Alan, a lot of things that step you ahead was basically being the first person to have this equipment, mm. the first person who could go to these places and get this footage back. But it's a particularly difficult one within Deep Sea. It's kind of what forces it to be quite an exclusive club because it's experimental tech, really expensive tech, and it's risky. Inevitably, you have to subject it to an extreme environment and there's a high failure rate. And it's difficult to get funding for that. It's difficult to, to win people over. So you had some thoughts about technology, particularly relating to, to deep sea tech and the, the hurdles we have to overcome, Alan. Yeah, I think we're going to talk about the cost of going deep. What do you think? I mean, the psychological cost is enormous. <laughs> psychological cost is enormous, but financial cost. Let's think a little bit about that, right? So the American economist and Harvard professor Theodore Levitt once said something like, people don't want to buy a quarter-inch drill. They just want a quarter-inch hole. Right, so think about that for a while. So within the science literature, there are many contemporary opinion and perspective papers and high impact journals discussing why action must be taken to preserve the deep sea or the oceans, whatever it may be. And they always acknowledge the most critical gaps are and knowledge are, are often reviewed again in similar high impact papers and often include frameworks for addressing the most pertinent biological and ecological questions essential to addressing fundamental understanding. You get the idea, right? So there's this mantra of we need to know more about X, Y, and Z at greater spatial, geographic, temporal, and bathymetric scales. And on, to be honest, on scales never before attempted. And it's reiterated countless times to the point it literally makes people burp with exasperation. I don't know if that's actually true. I added that, but anyway. Few rarely address the all-important issue of how we're going to do this. And this has become a frustratingly cyclic rhetoric that descends into a long, slow downward spiral into the darkness like the icy corpse of Leonardo DiCaprio at the end of Titanic. Or even Ed Harris's harrowing descent into the abyss in the film The Abyss. But for society to absorb meaningful research, scientists must reconcile insights derived from theory, which is your chin-scratching department, with detailed exploration and experimentation in the field, which is where the real heroes are. And, of course, broad-scale ecological trends, which is where the sense of natural world is decimated in the search of statistically significant p-values. But this requires a level of applied research which simplified model systems can't mimic, and laboratory experiments rarely represent real-world multifunctionality in the deep sea, and for that we need technology. We need to get underwater. So we need technology developed at a spatial, temporal, geographic and bathymetric scale that truly and meaningfully represents the estimated 435 million square kilometres of deep sea, and in the current era of climate Armageddon, how do we do it quickly? And how do we do it while avoiding the creation of an artificial yet malevolent neural network-based superintelligence system such as Skynet? The slow progress of deep sea biology is often largely a result of equipment being ridiculously expensive. So new technologies underpin discoveries that challenge major ecological hypotheses, but it by no means addresses the issues that deep sea technology, particularly for biological applications, is not inherently very, very expensive. So while no one would criticise recent advances in deep sea technology in terms of capability, we cannot afford it on the scale that is needed at a reasonable cost, and so the piecemeal model system keeps, keeps going, albeit even better technologies that still fail to address the scale and urgency that is absolutely critical. So yeah, sure, we've got ROVs and submersibles, and, but in the grand scheme of things, there are very few in numbers and they're not easily accessed by everybody. So even if we look to develop smaller and more numerous vehicles, going deep is still crazy expensive, even at the individual component or instrument level, regardless of the vehicle platform. So imagine having to pay 50 bucks for a quarter inch drill to get your quarter inch hole in your kitchen wall, but then having to pay 200 bucks for a quarter inch drill to get your quarter inch hole in the upstairs bedroom, and then pay 2000 bucks for a quarter inch drill to get your quarter inch hole in the roof. At the end of the day, you have three quarter inch holes, exactly the same. And that's something that happens in the deep sea business. It's very odd. So one of the reasons deep sea biology is so expensive is because scientists are constantly using equipment designed to maintain an air cavity, and they do not necessarily want or even need that air cavity and probably never even thought about it. So this problematic little space is a package of air that surrounds the electronics and sensors that needs protecting from the external seawater to keep them dry, to stop them being crushed by pressure, and these unwanted air spaces are costing deep sea science millions of dollars and actually don't offer much in return, in fact nothing at all in terms of quality and quantity of data. A good example is underwater camera. So here we have a scenario whereby there is, for example, a 10 megapixel camera capable of taking a photograph every minute, let's say. If this was operated by divers, this camera could be readily housed in an inexpensive plastic tube with a plastic acrylic window on it or something like that, relatively cheaply made. For operations in the deep sea, about 200 metres, this would need to be housed in a, either a much thicker plastic one or probably a lightweight aluminium housing, which would then 
increase the cost significantly. For operations at bathial depth, 200 to 3,000 metres, the housing will get thicker and probably move to a more expensive grade of aluminium, because that has to withstand a greater pressure, and by the time it was operated at abyssal depth, which is down to 6,000 metres, it's likely to be housed in a duplex stainless steel housing, which increases the cost again and significantly increases the weight. So a common alternative at these depths is then to switch to titanium, which brings the weight back down, but then becomes phenomenally expensive. So if operating at full ocean depth, the titanium option would make the camera just absolutely ludicrously expensive, and yet the stainless steel option will make the camera too heavy to even lift by a human. I mean, our original video control system for the original Hale lander weighed 105 kilos in air. It took uh, about two or three of us to get it on the lander, whereas the new one became the baby. It was a one-man lift, but it was painful. Uh, and Mark III, you could sculpt your guns with one arm on it. So yeah, things are things are getting smaller. The cost increase per thousand meters depth, right? Think about that. How much does it cost more for every thousand meters deep you go? It actually makes it more and more unaffordable. So the deeper you go, the less affordable it is, right? So, and the rate of the weight increase with depth is financially exacerbated in the likelihood at some point in the whole operation, you're going to have to offset the weight of that device in water with some sort of buoyancy. So the heavier it is, the more buoyancy you need, the more buoyancy you need, the more cost it is. And the whole thing starts to get out of control. The important point to be made here is whatever the rate of cost increase occurs, the quality and quantity of the end product, the data, is exactly the same. You'll end up with a series of 10 megapixel photographs taken at one minute apart. The only difference is you've paid a lot more for it. So thus all the cost and weight problems are directly related to maintaining the airspace of the camera and not the desired quantity or quality of data. And at the end of the day, you still end up peering through a quarter inch hole. So I did a cost analysis of our own camera and the relative cost of a full ocean depth camera was the housing itself comprised 94% of the cost of the camera. So the ability to stop it being crushed was 94%. The actual part that collects the data was 6% of the camera. So to assess and value at this point with regards to cost across multiple technologies, I contacted 10 supply companies that provide instruments at multiple depth range. So it has to be the same instrument at different depth ranges to try and work out how much it actually genuinely costs to go deep. So product supplier with a single operational depth but not included. So the study comprised 13 products with 45 different depth options, included O2 sensors, ADCPs, standalone conductivity temperature depth sensors, acoustic releases, video cameras, stills cameras, the lights, so on. And I devised my own measure of financial assessment, and that's bucks per kilometre depth, right? How many bucks per thousand metres? So if you take the standard environmental sensors like current meters and O2 sensors and CDTs and so on, the types of sensor packages needed to monitor baseline conditions, each product showed a linear increase in price with depth, with no difference in data quality or quantity. For example, acoustic current meters cost an additional 700 bucks for every thousand meters you went deep. CDTs were 420 bucks for every kilometer you went deep. Acoustic releases, a very popular way of deploying moored systems and moorings and so on, but the acoustic releases cost increase were 1,800 bucks for every kilometer you go deep. So imagine that's, that's 1,800 for every thousand meters you go. Do you imagine how much a 10,000 meter one costs? So the first two trends are linear. And one of the acoustic releases was crazy because a lot of these companies will switch to titanium, so the cost actually becomes exponentially more expensive as you go down. A lot of the video and still cameras are better because they're becoming smaller, and smaller and lighter. So there's still increases of up to a thousand pounds or a thousand bucks per kilometre and so on. But a lot of these instruments, even the small ones that are quite cheap, suddenly become expensive again because they're not supplied with power control or logging systems. So you have to then build that yourself. So that's automatically more expensive and the chances are it's going to be relatively crude compared to an off-the-shelf design and so on. So suddenly your, your costs go back up again. So to answer the question of how much does it cost to go deep, we could take a very crude estimate by averaging everything that I did in this really, really dodgy, statistically non-robust financial system. And it's somewhere between 500 and 1,000 bucks per 1,000 meters. That's how much more it costs to go deep. And at the end of the day, you don't get any increase in quality and quantity of the actual data. The quarter inch hole is still a quarter inch hole. So the solutions to the problem are greatly reduce the size of the technologies to be deployed at depth, right? So if you bring the size down, you bring the weight down and you, you're reducing that airspace. So you're reducing the financial responsibility to maintain it. Although otherwise eliminate the airspace. So yeah, you go pressure tolerance, yeah, you solid encapsulate it, or you can pressure compensate it with an air oil or, or silicon film or a bit like filling all of Ed Harris's body cavities with liquid oxygen in that film Abyss. Remember that, Tom? I do. Yeah, it was just a film off the top of my head, you know. And it would also be a little bit like replacing the T-800 Terminator unit, which are just crude synthetic organisms draped over a titanium hyper exoskeleton that wouldn't fare well in the deep sea. If you would replace that with a liquid metal shape-shifting T-1000 Terminator based on nanomorph technology, it would work much better, wouldn't it? Because there's no airspace to collapse. That's, that's a weird analogy to draw. I don't yeah. know. It just, it just came to me the other day when I was thinking about air cavities 
I thought Ed Harris. Ah, oh, where is it? But anyway, so the solution is not easy given the, the types of sensors and subcomponents that this applies to. However, we live in an age where the technology such as cameras and microprocessing power are significantly greater within your cell phone in your pocket than what is contained within a deep sea instrument. And those deep sea instruments are costing us thousands or tens of thousands of pounds, dollars, euros, whatever to purchase. So if the operational depth could be replaced with limitless depth, i.e. it doesn't even have a depth rating, then deep sea products would no longer be bespoke, made to order expensive units that have lots and lots of failure points. So this reduces unit manufacturing costs, provides flexibility in the operational depth, and rethinking how instruments are designed, sold and delivered to the deep sea is wide-reaching and highly important in today's marine landscape. I think that is what underpins all of it, is to stop doing, stop using the design principles we've had for decades. Think of it a little bit differently. Go from crude synthetic organisms draped over a titanium hyperalloy exoskeleton and replace them with liquid metal shape-shifting T1000 terminators based on nanomorph technology, for example. Just plucking that out there. Yeah. Or take Ed Harris and fill his body cavities full of liquid oxygen. It's that the principle is the Sounds same. Sounds like a threat. Well, if you put Ed Harris down into the abyss, for example, he has air cavities and that needs to be maintained and his body is not strong enough. He could have been made of something stronger like uh, an optanium or something like that. And then maybe he would be able to, to withstand that pressure, but he can't. So then the trick is fill him with liquid oxygen. Ah. Sorted. I feel like there's a, I feel like there's a through thought here. I don't, I, you might not have noticed it. I doubt it's deliberate. I think it's subconscious. No, we need to speak to someone about technology. Some of these technologies I've just mentioned. Who, who, who should we talk to? Who would know about Ed Harris's body cavities and T-1000 Terminators? Or the icy corpse of Leonardo DiCaprio? Or Skynet? The, the only common factor there is... Um, well, it's James Cameron, isn't it? Should we get him on the phone? Yeah. Come on, let's give him a phone. Yeah, you, you can just call him up. Yeah, all right, let's do it. Let's, let's call James Cameron. <laughs> Mr. James Cameron joins us today from New Zealand. Who are you, James? Uh, very well, thanks. And uh, thanks for having me on the podcast, Alan. Welcome, welcome, welcome. So... As, as part of this whole podcast series, we've already heard loads of different opinions about the deep sea, ranging from it being an almost tranquil and majestic place of natural beauty to something which is, you know, almost likes to touch paper of, of archetypal human fear. Mm -hmm. To you, what is it that makes deep sea such a compelling backdrop for both professional storytelling and personal exploration? Is it, is it the fear side or is it the beauty side? I don't see it as a place of fear, although certainly I, I think you have to be a little humble before the fact and acknowledge the, the technical difficulties of, of getting there and operating there, which you certainly know very well through, you know, through your work. I think that the, the challenge of it and the fact that it's this vast unknown that's still an unknown in a planet that seems to have gotten very small and very well described and very well traveled, and one can do tourism at the South Pole, and one can do tourism in orbit and see the entire world as one. And with Google Maps and the, you know, in the satellite pool, you can sort of visually explore almost everywhere on the surface of the planet. And it takes that screen of just a few meters of water, really, to cut out any kind of light or radio frequencies mm. that make the ocean this kind of vast terra incognita. And the deeper you go, the less well understood, the less well mapped, the less well described. So obviously, I know you personally have been fascinated by the extreme depths, the hadal depths, yeah. you know, what's there? You know, what lives there? What are the limits of life? What are the limits of vertebrate biology, for example? And you and you've yeah. sort of defined that. So for me, it's the it's the great question marks. It's, you know, what's down there? What's down there in the dark? How do we take our lights down there and our sensors down there and see it? And in, in my personal case, as a, an explorer at, at heart, I guess, in my DNA, I want to see it for myself. And I know we're going to get at some point to a discussion of piloted vehicles versus robotics, but I believe strongly in bearing witness and actually, and actually seeing it. Because it has an effect on you, uh, on your consciousness, on your on your emotion, and that's that's part of the drive as well. It really has very little to do with filmmaking, other than as a filmmaker, two things: one, it gave me the means, the the, the funds, the capital, if you will, to go and do it, and secondly, as a filmmaker, I kind of have both the skill set and a sense of duty or responsibility to tell the story, 
to come back and tell the story, which because I believe that's the flip side of bearing witness. You have to then come back and tell the tale and describe it and have photographed it well and share it with others. Be the point person or the avatar for the rest of the human race that doesn't get to make these amazing dives. Yeah, that was going to be my next question because you're in quite a unique situation where what were you, what are your motivations for this? Because in one respect, whether you with your explorer hat on, it's you immersing yourself into this environment. But from a, a filmmaking point of view, is you're trying to take that environment and give it to somebody else. Yes, exactly. I yeah, I think where people have consistently gotten it wrong is that they think my primary focus in life is to make entertainment films for mass audiences. And it really isn't. My primary focus in life is curiosity. And wherever that takes me, and whether that's curiosity about what narratives can work with people, if it's curiosity that might drive documentary filmmaking. So when I go into the ocean, it's as a as a documentary filmmaker, and I've <laughs> I've had a, a surprisingly large number of arguments with journalists who say, "Oh no, 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 come now, you're just down there trying to find new alien species so that you can <laughs> you can make a better Avatar movie." I say, "Are you are you kidding, mate?" I mean, pay attention here. You know, we've got, I've got the best designers in the world making up aliens left and right. And nothing that we do can compete with the imagination of nature itself. So I'm, yeah. I'm down there to, as, a, as a seeker, as a, you know, a sojourner, as a supplicant, if you will, before the majesty of, of nature in all its glory. That's where I worship. That's my church down there. You know, so it's really got virtually nothing to do with making a better Avatar movie. I'd say it's more the other way around. If I make a good film and people go see it, I get money. I take that money and I put it into developing submersibles and deep ocean robotics and cameras and lighting systems and so on. So the the, the theme, if you like, of this particular episode of the podcast we, we, we're, we're going to do uh, is technology, because uh, we haven't really touched on that yet. Mm -hmm. With that in mind, you know, when we're talking about deep sea, we're talking about, you know, hails at depth and things like that. You're looking at high pressure, massive distances from the surface, cold temperatures, everything which is challenging, everything which is techni technically problematic. So from your opinion, do you find the technical challenges something of a an obstacle, something that which is, which is you have to, as a hurdle you have to jump to get where you want to go? Or do you see it as part of the enjoyment of the journey? Uh, it's absolutely part of the pleasure solving the problem. now. Just as as you know from your experience, you can have some incredibly vexing days at sea. Oh yeah, where your your tech isn't working, you know. But you learn from those days and those moments and those technical failures. But for me, the a part a big part of the excitement is the challenge of creating machines that can go into I would say arguably the most hostile environment on Earth. I think it's easier to build a spacecraft than yeah. it is to build a, a, a deep ocean system. First of all, spacecraft are much better funded than we are. But secondly, you're dealing with pressure regimes that, that butt right up against the edge of material science itself. When you're dealing with hadal depths, you're at the failure level of the actual materials themselves. And yeah. you know, electronics despise seawater you know, because it's an electrolyte, a conductor, and it, it fritzes them out. And you've got total darkness. You've got the complete inability for electromagnetic radiation to propagate through the water. So you're, you're entirely dependent on acoustics for navigation and calms unless you can get a fiber tether. You know, When you're dealing at hadal depths, it's pretty hard to run a big fat armored cable, run, run power down there you know, 10 miles or so. You know, because everybody think, oh, well, it's only seven miles, but it's it. you've also got scope on that cable as it gets deflected by currents and as the ship moves around at the surface and all that. So you're really talking about sort of a 10-mile cable. You're, oh. you're, you're literally up against the tensile strength of the, the steel in the, in the cable itself. So these light, elegant uh, fiber optic cables work or fully autonomous vehicles. Then you get into some really interesting uh, areas of tech where as we expand our ability to have AI and deep learning and machine learning and so on, we, we're going to build smarter and smarter vehicles to go down there and perform more and more of the tasks that previously required kind of real-time human-in-the-loop control system. So that's an exciting development, I think, personally. I don't know how you feel about it. I think it's interesting when you speak to engineers who specialize in corrosion as well. So they, they list all these things, yes. and on top of everything else, the sea is also trying to eat your gear. <laughs> it's like, yeah, it's, it's, it's physically trying, dissolving trying it. Yeah. it. Sure, yeah. and so you have to you have to be careful where you put your 
you know, your sacrificial anodes and, and yeah, you have to be careful about and... dissimilar metals in contact. And people tend to favor ceramics because they're immune, but they have their own problems. I, I love the tech. I love the challenge of the tech. I love, um, I'm not an engineer uh, officially, but I've certainly managed enough engineering projects over the last 25 years to say that I, I know enough to be dangerous. I can run a, a good group of, of engineers toward a goal. And so that sort of project management skill is a, is a learned art. But I, I love the technical challenges. But on those lines, I was going to remind you that a few years after you did the Deep Sea Challenger, I remember we we, we were talking about trying to reuse some of the technology that was developed through that project. Mm-hmm. And I, I put together yeah. this enormous EU grant to build these crawlers for Hadle Depth and, and all the rest of it. Yeah. And, and I remember the, the, the secretaries in the office when I came in this grant proposal, they're like, oh, James Cameron, that sounds like the guy who makes Avatar and so on. And I'm like, it, it, it is. <laughs> so <laughs> it, it, was really, it was a really exciting project to put together anyway. But the point is the... We got four reviews back. Two of them said, this stuff is brilliant because unless someone goes out and does this kind of stuff, we'll never be at the point of hypothesis-driven science. Right. The other two said, this is rubbish. This is not hypothesis-driven science. And you know, <laughs> and this is, this is something which has plagued everything we do. So my question to you is, That's where okay. are we in terms of exploration and society's sort of uh, take on what exploration is? I mean, the days of just going somewhere for the hell of it seem to be over. But yeah, they were extremely valuable days. Sure. I mean, the idea of hypothesis-driven science is that you already know a lot. You can yeah. extrapolate, you know, maybe 5% beyond what you know and expect a result. Now go find the result you expect. So it's basically what I, I like to call confirmation bias science. Hmm. You already know what's going to happen, and you only look at the data on the basis of what fits your <laughs> hypothesis. Yeah. So there's an innate trap there. I think it's much more interesting to just go and look someplace nobody's ever been. Look at the discovery of hydrothermal vents. Yeah. There was no hypothesis that that existed that I know of, that that chemosynthesis, those chemosynthesis-based communities existed down there. Somebody went down there, took a look, and said, holy <laughs> look what's down here. Look what's thriving. Look at this enormous amount yeah. of biomass. We didn't predict this. We just went down to see what was happening at, you know, hot hot vent sites at at spreading centers. You know, it was a geology yeah. expedition that suddenly turned into a biology expedition. That's yeah, what science should lean into more, right? Yeah. Now, I think we we know enough to make some fairly wild hypothetical predictions that might or might not prove to be true. And there was a good example of that from from my uh, Challenger Deep expedition. We had Patty Fryer on board and Kevin Hand from the Jet Propulsion Laboratory. And Kevin was very interested in serpentinization because it supports these big bacterial communities and because he's studying Europa and trying to find analogs on Earth that, that might might give us clues what we might find on the ice moons out there, Europa and Enceladus. You know, he said, Patty, where am I going to find serpentinization? It's never been seen at at Hadal Depths, at least supporting biological communities. And Patty said, well, you know, I mean, if we look on the northern slope right at the margin of the, of the sediment or a little, a little above it, we might see where the water is being pressed out of the rock from the, from the ingoing plate way down underneath and coming up and, and surfacing there, or meaning coming to the, the surface of the seafloor. That's where we looked. We tried looking there in the east pond, and I didn't see anything, but we dropped one of our landers right onto a bacterial mat at the Sirena Deep. And we, we managed to score a bullseye with one drop and uh, landed right on bacterial mats and more or less proved the hypothesis, at least a preliminary sort of indication. that They are, they are much more prevalent than you would think. So since, since that discovery, I mean, they're, they're all over the Mariana Forearc and they're all over the Java Trench Forearc. We, we saw yeah. similar things in Tonga. You know, when you start looking at the convergence zones around the Pacific... Yeah. They're everywhere, you know, immeasurable a number of these things. Yeah, exactly. And that's a, a now known to be widely spread biological community. I don't know where I don't know where the science is now on the proposition that since that was a stable energy source for billions of years, that that could be a plausible place for the emergence of life. We talked about this on one of the podcasts because it's one of these arguments that goes back and forth all the time. Was it on land? Was it on sea? Was it on land? And the, the latest yeah. theory was it, it needed ultraviolet light. So that, that that then just knocks out the deep sea. But then 
six months from now, I think someone else might come out and say, well, it didn't need an ultraviolet light. It could have been hydrothermal fins. So I don't know. It's such a contentious subject that I think is... Well, yeah, it is. It is. Yeah, I, think, I think chemosynthesis, yes, but the, the, where that is set is is the big question. The next question I was going to ask was, a lot of your films deal with quite cautionary tales about technology or, or unchecked yeah. advancements and things like that. And so what are your thoughts on things like deep sea tourism and industrialization and deep sea mining? Should we be pushing for a greater presence in the ocean and then run that sort of apocalyptic film risk of getting it wrong? Or are you more for the more people in the sea, the more people will appreciate it, the more we might look after it? We, you know, it's a, it's a really difficult question. Setting aside the, the depth factor, we're not leaving the sea alone. We're raping it just about as fast as humanly possible. Wherever there's a penny to be made, we're there. So we've pretty much cut huge swaths through the food webs. We've basically wiped out about 90% of the apex predator biomass. And now we're working our way down the kind of trophic levels practically to the krill. A lot of our Runoff pollution has destroyed primary production in a lot of these eutrophic dead zones, 400 dead zones at the mouths of major rivers. Um, we're basically using the oceans as a toilet in an unclosed loop. It's just open circuit. We're just dumping our sewage and our, our industrial waste. So I don't see how much more damage we could do to the ocean if we literally sat around and said, okay, guys, how do we screw up the ocean? <laughs> uh, <laughs> as a challenge. You know, yeah. I think it's probably uh, naive to think that if it ever becomes economically viable to mine the deep sea, that we won't do it. Of course, we're going to do it. We mined every other damn yeah. place. We've, we're destroying the Amazon headwaters. We're destroying rainforests and indigenous populations in you know South America with gold mines and various other mining operations. So I think it's naive to think that we won't do it. So I mean, I think as a deep sea community. It would be incumbent on us to try to at least get some guidelines in yeah. for how to do it with the least impact biologically to some of these ecosystems that we've barely studied. You know, some of the ones along the Mid-Atlantic Ridge and some of the other popular spreading centers, the East Pacific Rise and so on, are pretty well described. But such vast amounts of the of the deep ocean that just haven't even really been looked at with any kind of proper funding. It'd be nice if we understood it before we destroyed it. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, we we did a big thing earlier this year about a, a species from the Mariana Trench, which we found, and it was a brand new species, and it was already full of plastic. Yeah, and you're like, this is this is the first time this has ever been seen, and it's already done. You know, it's, it's he, already contaminated, right? Yeah, and that, I think that was the most tragic thing about that whole story was when people say, well, what, what does what does it do? What, what's this plastic doing to the animal? I say, well, we don't know what the animal was like before. Yeah, so there's no baseline. There's no, <laughs> that's gone now. It's, yeah. That was a quite a tragic Well, we, thing. we either have no baseline or we have a shifting baseline, and the baseline yeah. is shifting so rapidly. You do the same coral transect 10 years later, it looks completely different. And then that's your new baseline, and then that new baseline becomes the, yeah. the, the baseline for another look. And our, our time series tend to be so far apart. You know, we're spoiled by the fact that from orbit, we can have pretty much real-time monitoring of atmospheric movement, wind speeds and water vapor contents and all those things. We're just so spoiled that we get these Doppler weather maps that are updated in pretty much real time. We have nothing like that in the ocean. It's, I'd say, five orders of magnitude sparser data for the same kinds of dynamics of temperature and current and salinity and all those things that affect the weather and affect climate and climate outcomes. You know, we need these vast sensor nets out there. We need these distributed swarms of small mobile sensors and so on that are reporting back to some central database in the same way that we have it for the atmosphere. And we just don't have anything like that. So sticking with the, uh, uh, technology, and this is a technical question I just wanted to ask you for my own selfish reasons. And that is, you know, we spend a great deal of time and money uh, developing or, or buying cameras to film for scientific reasons. But I think one of the things that I think we as scientists don't truly understand is the art of illumination, right? So let's just yeah. forget the big philosophical questions. Do you have any tips or what is the trick to lighten up underwater in the dark? Is you know, is, is it lots of lights, lots of small lights? Is it just light it up? Is it a science to it? Is it a magic art to it? You know, because I'm, I'm asking you because obviously you've, you're coming at this from different uh, perspectives. And I think it's something as scientists we get wrong quite a lot. And, it, you know, it could be done a lot better. Well, I think that, you know, the, the first rule of visible light photography is take a lot of light. Hmm. 
Um, <laughs> you know, so then that you start looking at the power envelope of your vehicle and what it can support and for how long. And of course, with LEDs now, we have much more efficient lighting in terms of power efficiency. And obviously, there are other spectra to look at and imaging in LIDAR, blue-green laser and things like that, which can reach farther. But if you're just talking about visible light photography, obviously, you want sensitivity on the camera and good resolution. And you don't want to light through the same water column that you're shooting through. That's the first rule of any underwater photography, regardless of depth. You know, when I was shooting the abyss, exactly the same rules that I had in a dark tank that was only 60 feet deep, I have the same rule set at 10,000 meters. Your field of view of the camera, you should try to limit the amount of water that it's looking through that's used to light the subject. So what you, what you want to do is create a long baseline, move the light away from the camera as far as your vehicle will allow. And everybody freaked out when we when we built an ROV, a little ROV for going inside shipwrecks and into tight spaces, where we put the camera all the way on the left of the vehicle. They said you can't you can't drive an ROV with the camera not on the center line. I said, do you sit in the center of your car? <laughs> of course you can. <laughs> but the objective there was to take you know we only had a 14 inch baseline, so we put the camera all the way on on the left side, and we put the the main light all the way on the right side. In fact, we made a vertical strip that ran up the face of the vehicle so that we kept the lights projecting through the least amount of the water column that you were looking through. And this limits backscatter. And you never know what the turbidity of the water is going to be. I mean, fortunately, in the very deep ocean, it tends to be pretty crystal clear. But if you stir up the bottom, you still, you'll still you have a backscatter issue. So yeah, so you want to have power efficient lights. You want to have a lot of them. You want to have a power envelope on your vehicle, whether it's robotic or human piloted that's big enough to support your lighting. And it always falls off the bottom of the to-do list when the engineers are trying to design a vehicle. It's funny, a while ago I was talking to uh, Kelvin McGee, who I think was with you on one of the Titanic yeah. expeditions, and he, he was telling me about this lighting rig that you've built. I think you refer to it as a second sun. <laughs> it was some, <laughs> some e enormous, huge lighting rig. And it's like, well, if you're going to light the Titanic, you need a big light. The Titanic is a tough subject because it's uh, rusted steel, so it's basically orange red in color. As you know, uh, you know, red and orange are the first colors to drop out to be naturally filtered out by transmission through water. So let's say you're you're trying to light a couple of hundred feet of Titanic, which is only a small fraction of its total size. You're putting out light 150 feet away, and then it's got to come 150 feet back through the water. That light started out as white light. By the time it got to the wreck, it was now blue. What remained of it, the blue photons were getting through. And then it's bouncing off the Titanic, which is orange, which means that it's absorbing blue light and reflecting red, but it's not getting any red light. Now it's got to come back through the water column, that red light, what remains. So you're down to now 2% of your original photons. Now you're coming back that 150 feet and it's filtering out you know, 90% of your red photons before it gets back to the sensor at the camera. You basically wind up with nothing. So we said, we have to take a one metric shit ton of lights into the deep, <laughs> which is, that was our goal. I said, I want every light that anybody has anywhere that can survive that pressure. And so we rounded up the 1200 watt PARs that were available and we bolted them onto to a purpose built ROV that was basically a big slab of syntactic and a, a bunch of old bits of kit that they had lying around at the, at the engineering company. And we, we made a chandelier, essentially a down-pointing chandelier. And when it came on, it lit up the Titanic. It was actually quite impressive. <laughs> that's how you like the Titanic. <laughs> yeah, I mean, how, how else could you, right? Yeah, but I mean, that's not practical. At the kind of depths that you're operating at, that's not practical. No, no, really I know. Nece necessary. It's fascinating. I never thought of that, the whole thing. Of course, it's rusty. It's red. It's the worst possible color to film. It never, it never really dawned on me before that was a... Yeah. That would be a problem. Of course it is. It makes perfect sense. The only saving grace there was that there had been a slow deposition of protonaceous snow, you know, the, over the entire wreck. So it was sort of dusted by, by sugar, like you'd, you'd dust a cake. So we were able to get an image at least off the top surfaces of the ship. So another, just another couple of quick last questions for you. And I think these are just, just, just for fun. Is, the first one question is, with nearly nine years of, of hindsight on the Mariana dive, is there one moment in that? whole expedition that is the thing that you remember the most? What do you look back on with the, with the biggest grin on your face? The way I operated the sub, I, I had a viewport, but 
we had a kind of an unusual, ergonomically unusual configuration where I was in a seated cross-legged position and I, I wasn't driving like a normal submersible pilot in a kind of reclined, you know, supine on my stomach type position. Mm -hmm. So I, I was operating through a camera, through an HD camera with a wide lens, a 4K image, but I had it set up such that I could unship that camera, unmount it and swing it out of the way and get my eye to the viewport, which took a bit of contortion and a couple of years of yoga paid off to be able to do that because this whole sphere is only three feet in diameter on the inside and get my eye down to the viewport and just sit there and like literally bear witness with the naked eye to, you know, arguably the most remote place on planet Earth. People have been to the poles, people have been to, you know, all kinds of remote, difficult to reach places, but at least in terms of pure distance, and depth and pressure and all that. It was, you know, the most remote place one could access without going into space. And to just sit there and, and you know, I remember looking out and the bottom is very featureless there. It's all, it's yeah. like new fallen, new fallen snow, which I think is actually an apt metaphor because I think it's all been stirred up by some big seismic event in geologically recent times. And uh, it hasn't had a lot of biological activity to mar the bottom with worm tracks and uh, various invertebrate tracks like you normally see. I mean, you've seen a lot of benthos. You know that at least at abyssal depths, you're constantly seeing the, the records of activity, uh, even if the animals aren't, aren't physically present. But I didn't yeah, see there's, that there's a whole there. road network there, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And I didn't see that. I, I, I saw just very sparse indications of that. So the sea bottom doesn't change very rapidly. I just felt like I was looking at something absolutely untouched and no human eyes had ever seen and felt that that was a gift. Yeah. I always feel that in, in these exploration enterprises, you have to train yourself to stop and smell the roses. You have to train yourself to stop and, and bear witness because I, I get very technical. I get very much like I'm, I'm there to solve a problem. I've got to do this. I've got to do that. I've got to hit all the things on my dive checklist. And sometimes you just have to stop and look and let it seep into you mm. where you are and what where you are means. And so it's that moment, I guess, when I just looked out the window and just sat there for a few minutes. Yeah, I think I, we've, we've kind of talked about this this before on the podcast. I mean, it's uh, certainly when I've done sub dives, it's, it's you're in the moment, right? Your 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 adrenaline is up. You're taking in loads of information. Yes. You're trying to do this, and you have to actually stop yeah. yourself and go, "Hey, take five minutes and just enjoy it." Yeah, exactly. I remember once I think it was in the Puerto Rico. We parked a sub down and just had a sandwich. Literally sat yeah. on the seafloor and just like like two two guys yep. on a park bench, just just having a sandwich and going, "We should actually just enjoy this." You know, we'll we'll, we'll finish the mission in a minute, right? We'll do it in a minute. It's fine. And it's okay to enjoy science. Yeah. It's okay to enjoy what you're doing and where you are, you know, it's okay to yeah. feel your, your curiosity is being satisfied. So finally, just for fun, assuming there's no restrictions whatsoever, anything goes, what bit of deep sea technology would you want, no matter how far fetched? Now you're talking to a science fiction writer. I know. So that's how far fetched is far fetched. All right. The well, most, the most, the furthest. All right. The farthest, I'm going to give you a proximal one that's doable, but still a ways down the road, which is I'd love to have two-ton maximum glass-sphered uh, solo or, or two-seater subs that could be deployed from any ship of opportunity very easily without a big complex handling system mm -hmm. that are either full ocean depth or at least 6,000 meter rated. I think that's a doable thing. I'm talking about something on the scale of a deep worker yeah. uh, or a dual deep worker because you can get them in the water and the cost of, of these piloted vehicles, you know, cruises, is really about the size of the ship. So if you could cut your ship in half, in terms of length, you cut your costs by uh, three quarters, something like that. So that's the proximal one that I think is doable. You just need to learn more about glass technology than we currently know. I think if you if you want to talk far fetch, like really out there, yep, I would like to have my consciousness embedded into a robot that can go anywhere. Now either by <laughs> yeah, either by some kind of uh, electronic transfer into uh, you know into an uh, an AI controlled vehicle, yep. or uh, maybe more in the near term, you know, kind of like a cyborg. You know, take my brain, stick it in a machine, let me go anywhere. I'll start with walking around the sea floor at any depth hmm. I want to go to. Do you get your consciousness back at the end? Yeah, this is no, important. It's, it, it's all that's left of you at that point. So you have to okay. say it's you. Right. 
and uh, and then I'll you know I'll kick around for a while developing my skill set, and then they're going to launch me to Europa, and I'll do the same thing under the ice there. I think the sediment's really thick and sticky, so you need skis. I think it'd be what you'd, you'd look like something. You'd look like a polar explorer. You would have to sort of like ski across the Bissell Plains and down this down the trench slopes and things like that with your little robot. Well, what I'm visualizing is a crab with thrusters. Right. So it can it can fold its legs up like any self respecting crab can do. Yep. Become more streamlined, thrust around, and then deploy the legs when you want to and walk around, whether that's on a rocky substrate nice. or you know, yeah. So Love there it. you have it. That's the best answer I could have hoped for. <laughs> <laughs> and with that in mind, Mr. James Cameron, thank you very much for coming on the Deep Sea Podcast. Okay, well, it's great talking to you again, Alan, as always. And uh, you know, I know you're a, a true believer and you've done amazing work. Just keep it up. I'm trying. I'm trying my best. Brilliant. Thanks very much. I really, honestly, I really appreciate it. I understand you're really busy and everything else. And it's great just to chat to you again. The crab thing is brilliant. Love it. Well, you're going to see it in Avatar 2. Oh, really? Yeah. I had, I had ulterior motives as I, was, uh, as I was working with the designers on that one. <laughs> one of the questions I was going to ask was how much of the stuff, you know, when you, when you develop these technologies for the movies, is that just stuff that you really want? Yeah, I just want to build it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. If you can't have it in real life, you might as well just make it and, and put it in the films and go, yeah, I want a giant floating crab thing with, with my consciousness in it. That's yeah. actually just a, a wish list. Probably. Yeah, exactly. As as you do. Yeah, why not? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Brilliant. I really enjoyed that. I'd not really heard James Cameron sort of speak so candidly about, about the technology and about his sort of deep sea philosophy. He's really articulate. I really enjoyed that. Yeah, no, it's brilliant. It's brilliant. I love the the crab, the Avatar two crab. That's genius. I love the confession of it's just like oh, I want all this stuff, and I get get people to draw pictures of it for me. I did like that. You're asking a science fiction writer, <laughs> what's the weirdest thing you can come up with? And it's like, yeah, buckle up. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> no, that's great. It's really good. It's a nice bloke. Yeah, and then you can say for the rest of your career, Tom, that you were the guy who censored James Cameron. I know, because this is this is a family friendly podcast. What? What on earth did he say behind those beeps? We'll never Who know. Who knows? Who knows? It's not for you, years. He wrote the foreword to your book, didn't he? Yeah, he wrote a little endorsement for the back of it, yeah. Yeah, I'm really grateful for that. Cool guy. I hope. I really do hope that one day that he gets his his consciousness downloaded into a giant crab. I think he deserves <laughs> it's it. It's all he wants. All he wants <laughs> is to be a yeah. crab on Europa. Yeah, I hope, I hope that, that dream comes true for him. He was kind of describing astral projection, casting his consciousness out into the void. If you're making a perfect copy of your consciousness why would you stop at one yeah copy once it. you've already digitized it why not have an army because that's that's how you end up with skynet he has warned us about that he has done the odd cautionary tale but that, that feels sort of close to what we've been dabbling with with the sort of machine learning stuff because i feel like that's making a rudimentary tom that will make the decisions i would make if i was down there for the landers you know i take the pictures of the things that i would take the picture of if i had the camera in my hand but anything I build is not going to be smart enough to take over anything. Be lucky if it remembers to switch on. Uh, to be honest, my stuff seems to definitely switch on. It just doesn't switch off all the time. <laughs> it sometimes keeps going until the batteries are flat. Yeah, it just switches on too hard sometimes. <laughs> oh, we've all had our bad days. So the question we asked him basically was, uh, like, what would be your dream piece of tech? What sort of like a, a feasible on the horizon bit of new deep sea tech? And what is like super, super sci-fi if you could have anything? Super sci-fi would be one of those four wheels from Star Trek that you could just make itself a zorbing bubble and then you could just walk around. Just hamster ball along the deep yeah, sea? Yeah, just hamster balling everywhere. That'd be cool, wouldn't it? I don't know. I, I guess you would have to transport oxygen in and out of the out of the ball as well, but you know, there's a little bit of housekeeping to be done there. But yeah. I think mine is sort of a, a two-step one. I think the, the first step is similar to you. I, I really enjoyed his whole bearing witness thing and the way he spoke about it almost spiritually. And it's something that's that's turning up from from quite a lot of the discussions because I, I was I was originally like not keen on on human occupied like the cost it drives up and the the operational time and things like that I was all like you know an ROV but I'm seeing so much more of the merit of this like emotional response people have when they see it for sort of firsthand well it sounds to me like you're about to start a new religion called the children of the abyss is that right well me no me and Amy started that because we, we kept thinking about these animals that have like gone undisturbed for decades. And then this blinding light comes down from above and offers them the best meal they've ever had and then sort of disappears again. And then what do they tell their mates about that? What, how do they explain that? And it could only be as like a, a religious or an alien experience. So yeah, we actually ended up doodling some like hieroglyphics of 
these rat tails gathering around Orlando. Children of the abyss. So yeah, my, my sort of first feasible one was again to like get that personal connection and bear witness. So just an exosuit, basically, just to essentially I want to be a space marine. I want to be stomping around the abyssal plains, you know, for the emperor of mankind. The second like super sci-fi thing that I'd love for the sea to look like air. So I'm stomping along the abyssal plain and I can look up and see a whale like it's a commercial plane. Like I can just see a whale way up there in the surface sort of cruising along. Yep. And I can look across the trench like it's the Grand Canyon. That that would be it. You just want to see what all the vampire squid are doing, right? You just want to turn the lights on in the vampire department. They think they've got the place to themselves. They think they've got some privacy. There I am. Deep sea pervert, Tom Lindley. Because you with a heart-shaped <laughs> box of chocolates staring blindly into a vampire squid's eyes. Oh, well, that's not making the episode. No, I think that has to stay in. That is beautiful. You want that on the record? Yeah. You with a heart-shaped box of chocolates looking into the eyes of a vampire squid on Valentine's Day. In 20 years' time, I want my students to find that and they just never live it down. Yeah. <laughs> Was there anything sort of further on the techie end of things? Was it, you just want your hamster ball? I'd love a hamster ball. So having spoke to James Cameron, we can go to Don, who is a good friend of James Cameron's. They've known each other for quite a long time. Uh, we'll get Don's perspective on what he thinks about deep sea technology. Over to Don. Hello, my name is Don Walsh, and I've been an ocean engineer for nearly six decades. And I'd like to give you some ideas or thoughts I have on ocean engineering and what it means to me. First of all, all engineering, whether it's in the sea or on land, is really an art form. Sure, it's not like music or some kind of graphic arts, a painting or a nice photographic image. But it is an art. And I think probably the highest exemplar of art and engineering is architecture, which has to be at once a, uh, an expression of art, design, and form. But it also takes a whole lot of engineering. I mean, considering what it takes to engineer a 100-story high-rise building, and you know that's just a very, very big task. Well, let's define ocean engineering in the very simplest of terms. And it's simply this. It is the engineering arts and sciences getting wet. In other words, applying existing engineering arts and sciences to ocean problems. Now, what is the role of ocean engineers? It really is to design and construct things, machines, if you will, that do useful work in the oceans. But ocean engineering depends on the inputs from ocean science or oceanography. In essence, the end product, if you will, of ocean sciences is predictive information. That is, the scientist observes some phenomenon, develops a theory to uh, try and explain it, and then does experiments to test the theory and to see whether or not it's repeatable. And from that comes predictive information that the engineers can use to intelligently build machines or equipment drop in the oceans. And of course, there's a pretty good feedback loop there. It's not just the use of, uh, of scientific input, if you will, to build equipment, machines that are used outside of that particular discipline area, if you will. But this, the feedback loop is to also build machines and better equipment for ocean scientists to use. So new instrumentation, new sampling devices, and so on are all the result of intelligent engineering based on scientific input and also the requirements for trying to do scientific work better. Now, there are a lot of ocean engineering schools or curricula around, and some of them already go up to uh, the level of PhD. However, it's not required. If you think about the old days when there were apprenticeships uh, to carpenters, to shoemakers, to plumbers, you studied under for several years under a master in that particular trade or craft. And, and it's the same thing in ocean engineering. A lot of ocean engineers, some very fine ones, never had formal engineering training. In fact, James Cameron is an example of this. I consider him to be one of the finest shade tree engineers I've ever met. Jim and I first met in the early 1990s when he was considering a developing a, a one-person submersible to dive to the deepest place in the world ocean. I think that was around 1991. Then over the years, we interacted as we was developing this uh, program. And finally, in uh, uh, 2013, uh, I was able to go out to Australia and see his 
his manned submersible, Deep Sea Challenger, when it was under construction at Sydney. And then a couple of months later, I was invited to be on his expedition to Challenger Deep. And I actually spent 10 days at sea uh, on board the mothership and uh, observed him as he dove the into the Challenger Deep. I was the last person to talk to him before he shut the hatch. And all I said was, have fun, because I certainly had fun 50 years earlier when I had been one of the first two people to make that dive to the deepest place in the world ocean, Challenger Deep. And then when he came back up, when he surfaced at the end of the dive, I was one of the first people to greet him, along with his wife, uh, Susie. Now, while oceanography gets the big play, that is the big play in the sense of being attractive careers for people who want to go into, into work associated with the oceans and to scientific work. Everybody wants to be a modern-day Jacques Cousteau, who was a person I'd, I'd worked with uh, in earlier times, and I consider him, still consider Jacques to have been one of the great proponents of popularizing, and I don't say that in the pejorative sense, uh, oceanography. Everybody would watch those wonderful programs he did and say, you know, I'd like to be like that when I grow up. And guess what? That's what Jim Cameron told me once. He said, when I was growing up in Canada, I watched the Cousteau programs, and I said to myself, someday I'd like to be the modern day Jacques Cousteau. So that's high visibility. People want to do that, but we forget about it. And science standing alone is not all that useful. It has to be applied to problems and needs of society or humankind. And that's where ocean engineering comes in. I've already talked a bit about that. But it's not as glamorous as ocean science, and yet it's a very vital function. So if people are inclined towards things mechanical and so on, then I suggest that you consider ocean engineering. So I guess in, in summary, in closing out, all I could say is uh, the old phrase, so all you will be ocean engineers out there, come on in, the water's fine. Thanks for listening. Turns out that people are actually listening. So uh, I've been getting some emails out off listeners and they've been really good, actually. First one, actually, yeah, I'm going to call this this segment peer review. So we're getting a bit of feedback from listeners pointing out things we've got wrong, always willing to be wrong. When you're wrong, that's when things get interesting. The first one, one of our favorite words, factoid, us and I think most people actually use it wrong. Factoid is not a little fact. It means sort of something fact-like. So it's something that's presented as a fact, but in fact is not a fact and is untrue. So quite the opposite of what we were trying to use it for. So I thought that was really interesting. Uh, Shelley corrected us on that one. I will try and use factoid correctly. We've got some nice feedback from Chris, who is our blue collar fan in Washington state. He had some random feedback. I'm afraid, Alan, he's a big fan of the puns. Excellent. Both him and another listener wrote in to say, they would absolutely wear an I am your tongue now hat. So we do need to get sorted on the merch. Both of them mentioned um, they like the secret track or something like that. What secret track? I'm not putting anything on these, but I think maybe the podcast hosting is like adding an advert or something at the end of these. Well, so it's worth just waiting to see what happens at the end. I mean, I guess so. I'm not putting anything on there, but now they seem to enjoy them. So I won't complain if it's a good advert. Chris did actually have a couple of questions for us. And one of them was, do we feel that anything is omitted from the documentaries on the deep sea? Is there an animal or, or feature that we feel doesn't get its due credit? And I think we both said the same thing really on this one. Yeah, probably the rat tails don't. Because I think there's, there's two different types of aesthetic, animal aesthetic that, that make it in the media business. And it's those which are weird and ugly or you know just the bizarre monstrous ones or there's those that are bright and colourful or charismatic. And if you don't have either of those two qualities, you're kind of stuck in the middle, no matter how important you are. So when you think about things like rat tail fish or even holothurians, quite a lot of the time, you know, their numbers are huge. Their functional ecology is unbelievably important. Their footprint on planet Earth is absolutely massive, but they just don't make it into the public eye very often because they're not weird and they're not monstrous you get them swimming that'll make it if they've got nice yeah. footage of them swimming because that's something interesting they do and then but they don't get a story they don't get no. a backstory they're just an extra in another deep sea episode they don't get their own spin out series or anything like that and it's because they, they look a little bit sad i think the issue with the macroids so macroids the rat tails we, we spoke about them on a previous episode the, the members of the cod family i think the problem is they just look like fish and it, it doesn't fit fit the idea people have they've, they've got this weird whip-like tail but it's totally recognisable as 
a coddy looking fish with a chin barbel with a little whisker on its chin. So this this is a note to all future deep sea animals. If you're thinking about evolving to greater depths, just make sure you're weird and you have a thing. Yeah, make sure you stand out. Yeah, stand out, but have a thing that, you know, if you want to get noticed and recognised, preferably by luminescence, mm-hmm. or live next to a vent and do something weird. Oh, can I just have a total side rant now? Yes. Right. Bioluminescence is silent. <laughs> I'm sorry. This is my pet peeve for, for every documentary. It doesn't make a sound. It doesn't go... Because how, do you, how do you know? No, it Have you works. ever been next to a deep sea animal while it's bioluminescing? Maybe they had a microphone. It's deafening. All these sparkly noises. Xylophones going off. Now it just drives me mad. What does it smell like? Because remember, it's a defence thing, right? So not only does it sort of temporarily blend your eyes, it it would make a lot of sense for it to really stink. No, absolutely. A lot of sense, given the olfactory importance of a lot of these species. Probably taste awful as well. If you could blind two senses at once, you're right, actually. It, having a foul taste and smell would so be I good. reckon it stinks. Okay, so it's silent, but it stinks. Yeah. Okay. Silent but violent, silent I believe, is the phrase. Yeah. So how, how differently would we feel if you replaced all the blah, 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 for bioluminescence with fart sounds? That's what to do. So we're going to get more rat tails, and we're going to uh, replace the sounds of bioluminescence with fart sounds. Yeah. Every year around this time, I, I like to sort of reflect, and I like to go back and look at some of the people I've I've trained and mentored. And as I'm looking through LinkedIn, I like to find the ones that have become far more successful than me. So Izzy Rundle, this is just uh, just a quick courtesy call, just to let you know that you're you're nothing without me, and you owe it all to me. How you doing, mate? Uh, hi, mate. I'm pretty sure I owe you nothing and a scoop. <laughs> you succeeded in spite of me. <laughs> <laughs> uh, your special trainee has grown her own wings and is now smashing it. You really are. Izzy's from uh, from my past life where we, we used to be marine environmental scientists. So basically before any big development like an oil rig or pipelines, there'd be a, a pre-development survey. And we'd be officially sanctioned hippies who would then go and make sure none of the lovely animals would be upset by that. What's your title now? Uh, well, when I'm offshore, I'm a principal environmental scientist. And when I'm working in the office, I'm a senior project manager. And how do you know how many days of offshore you've done now? Oh, God, I worked it out once. I think the most I did in a year was 226. Oof, no, I think I got something like 220, something like that. But that's a, that's a lot of time offshore. That's a, you don't have a life that many days offshore you don't you actually just and when you are on land you rock a lot because your body is used to the movement of a ship but i think i worked it out once and i think i've spent something of the 13 years been working at sea at least half of those have been spent on the water if not more so you must have good stories you must have hundreds of stories is there an appropriate one you can share with us now? You, you told me one about an intense storm. I mean, I slept through quite a lot of this, but there was an intense storm. We were off the coast of um, off the uh, Shetland Islands, I do believe. And unfortunately, the storm came out of nowhere and caught two of our vessels, one of which I was on. I am renowned for sleeping through absolutely anything and everything. I've never been seasick in a day, touch wood. And I'm a napping pro. So this storm kind of came in and it was a bit rough and that's perfect nap time for me. So I went to bed. <laughs> <laughs> that is, it's perfect. It rocks you to sleep. It's a dream. The waves smashing against the hull, and you're like, ah. groaning bulkheads. That's <laughs> ah, that's it. That's music to you. I, I mean, I had a good deep sleep, and I woke up as I crashed into the deckhead. And so, if anyone that doesn't go to sea, the deckhead is like the ceiling. I thought, well, I better get up now then, really, see what's going on. So I made my way into the mess, you know, as you do when you're walking along, just swaying from side to side with the swell. The mess was destroyed. People were all kind of sat there. Some had packed little bags. They're all together in a huddle. One person was praying. And I was just like, you are right? Uh, what's going on? Solid gold veteran. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I don't know what it is about me, but I just sleep through those things. And honestly, um, like when you were down in the um, trough of the wave, like the peaks were higher than the vessel. And it was amazing to behold you just feel how small you are but at the same time perfect for napping we were lucky on that vessel because for anyone that is seasick those uh cabins they all had their own bathrooms the other vessel that was out not so lucky everyone shared three bathrooms on one deck when we finally met them in port they said it was a nightmare because everyone was ill just what what a bonding experience though you're, oh. you're really intimate by the end of that i do love a good storm i can remember trying to make it into aberdeen we had the bow thrust of full force. We had both screws on full power and we were going backwards two knots. 
we knew something had been damaged on the back deck because we heard something crashing around. And we found a, a square of weld just left on the deck and something had been torn away completely. What, what's the rule? Like an, an inch of tack welding is a ton. So an incredible force had pulled this piece of equipment off. The, the really frightening thing was, could anyone remember what was there? <laughs> we, were che- we were checking our phones. Like we still did the job. So it was obviously nothing we needed. <laughs> but something had been torn off the ship and no one could remember what was there. <laughs> I think that's classic, isn't it? On any back deck that you've like lived and worked on forever, it all just becomes a blur. So if something changes, you're like, something's different, but I couldn't tell you what. It's not my stuff. Oh my God. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, there is a bit of that kind of mentality, isn't there? Like, my stuff's all working. Sucks to be you. That's unfortunate. Yeah. <laughs> and then when, it's, when you know that when it's your stuff that's not working, everyone's sitting back being like, Ah, the roles have reversed. Especially when you've had like two weeks waiting for your time to shine and every single day you've turned everything on and you've tested it and then finally you get your shot. Yeah. And the camera won't initialize. Yeah. And everyone can roll their eyes. It's just like, why didn't you test it? You know, if you know you've had all this free time. No, every day. Every day I booted this thing up. Every day, green lights across the board. Now, now when I need it. They did have a lot of personality. Yeah, and, and depending on which unit you have. I mean, we've got two CTDs that we named Sally Gunnell and uh, who was the marathon runner? Is it Philippa something? Anyway, because Sally Gunnell, she, she, didn't, you know, she wasn't flashy, but she got us there. She nursed us over the line. And the other one, she'd start off good, but fail. <laughs> that is a thing. And they can be the same model, can't they? Yeah. They exactly. can be exactly the same model and yeah. one will have a personality. Yeah, exactly, exactly that. And all the people's quirks. I mean, you know, I remember people being like, you must tie a spanner with some bulldog to here or it won't work. And I never did that, ever. But some of the people swore by it. It's those kind of when you go offshore and you get those um, like superstitions. So if someone once tied a spanner there and it worked for them, they will forever always tie that spanner. Maybe you've been trying this thing for the last three hours and anything you did the time it worked, even though it was a total fluke, that'll be it from then on. Yeah, you never do anything different. Uh, thanks so much. We'll, we'll definitely come back for more stories because I know this is just the tip of the iceberg. And we might talk a, a little bit about um, careers in marine science and non-academic careers, being a hero and fighting the good fight within industry. Oh, well, thank you for having me, Tom. And I am more than happy to give you some more stories or talk about what I do for a living. And that concludes this month's episode of the Deep Sea Podcast. It seems to be steadily growing, and we're certainly enjoying doing these. It's a lot of work, but it's a lot of fun as well. But in order to offset the uh, large amount of time it's taking, unfortunately, we're interested in looking for sponsorship for the podcast, and we'd rather it was something relevant. Maybe a a technology company, products for the deep sea. We've talked a lot about technology and what makes good and bad technology a little bit on this episode. So if there's a company who would be interested in sponsoring the podcast, please let us know and we can figure something out. I hope you're all doing okay, and we will deep see you next time. Take care. The Deep Sea Podcast is supported by our company Armatus Oceanic. If you would like to explore the deep sea yourself, we can provide technology and know-how to allow you to do that. But if you'd like to bring the deep sea to your audience, we can also support you with fact-checking, storytelling, and presentations. We want the deep sea to be accessible to everyone. Coming this summer, a new documentary series reveals the deep sea as it really looks, or rather, as it really sounds. At a depth of over 2,000 metres, beyond every last photon of sunlight, you would expect a world of perpetual gloom. But the animals found here generate their own light, for communication, for deception, and for attack. A viper fish dangles a flashing lure in front of its tooth-filled mouth. This deception attracts the attention of a shrimp, which foolishly gets too close to that trap of a mouth. With lightning speed, the viper fish attacks. But the shrimp is not without its own luminescent defense. In a spectacular spray of light, the viperfish is dazzled and the shrimp is able to make its escape. This is not a world of darkness, but one filled with...
but one filled with filled with spectacular light show of incredible beauty.